Spiritual work is the hardest work there is. These are the 11 most essential rules to live by to develop an interior life. And because you're not going to watch this show, because it's hard work, unless we incentivize you, we are here to tell you that there is a major announcement. Restoring the faith will be changed forever, but you have to watch to the end of the show to know what we're talking about. And no, this is not hyperbole. Living the Faith Podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. That was, was that hyperbole, that intro? Hyperbole? Hyperbolic? (laughs) Hyperbolistic. Hyperbolistic. I like that. Yeah. If that word doesn't exist, we need to copyright it right now. Hyperbolistic. TM. I didn't go hyperballistic on that intro. This is, we are making a major announcement here that is going to change the landscape of restoring the faith forever. And it may very well change the lives of many of our listeners, viewers out there for a long time. But you have to make your way through the end of the show to receive that update. Joe, the hardest work in life, man. The hardest work. Look, we're, we're supposed to. No love and serve God. Getting to heaven is the most important work that we have to do on this earth, right? That's the only reason why we're here. It's not to surf Facebook. It's not to watch YouTube videos. Watch this YouTube video and subscribe to the channel. But that's not why we're here, right? No, it's very true. It's not why we're here. It is not why we're here. And but, you have to live the right way. You yeah, have to do. do everything the right way. And you, there, there are there are things that... We do, it's Catholics, that we think that by watching something or by saying something out loud or whatnot, that they were actually uh, fulfilling our end. Yeah. But we're at not. the end of the day, we don't do the, the most difficult things. And the hardest work uh, is mental work. You know, and, 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 and I, okay, I'm going to say something controversial because you know I love to stay away from controversy. Yes. That's what I, I live for. I live to avoid it. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to say something I, okay. As somebody who has lived outside professional, I was a professional bum. You know, I got paid to be a bum. I was active duty Marine Corps and I learned how to live outside and be a bum. That's hard work living outside. Okay. Digging trenches and doing stuff. Doing walkabouts. Yeah, exactly. Patrolling at 3am. You know, you miss out on sleep. You have cold food out of a bag. But I'm going to tell you that mental work is harder than physical work. That's my controversial statement. This is not, I'm not, look, I'm not making a value judgment here. I'm not saying that if you are in construction that you have a lesser job calling than a lawyer. But mental work is the hardest work. It is. It's exhausting. It Mm -hmm. takes more out of you. Mm -hmm. And nothing in our spiritual life is more difficult than cultivating an authentic spiritual life. That's why people shy away from it. And, and and I think the bigger problem is is that nobody um it's it's not something that's promoted anymore. Oh yeah. Whoa. Hello. Who are you? Hi. That's where I come in. Oh, <laughs> boom. Who are you? I well, actually, thank you for asking. I'm Mike. Across from me is Joe. Joe has the magnificent beard. Mike and Joe every week with you for the most part on the Living the Face show. Martin's not here, Tom's not here. Ben used to be with us, but rest in peace, Ben. Uh Kevin is here for the first time here in the studio. Ke- Let me just ask you, Kevin, how did you book a ticket to the heart of America? Which airport did you fly into? Well, you know, I just I just typed it in Google. You did. And it brought me somewhere to like uh like South America. So, uh, oh, you oh, know, I oh, had to... oh, wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, I d- don't tell everyone where we live. Okay. So you've already, you're, you're warm, you're hot. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Central time zone. Hola, como estas? <laughs> Bien, y tú? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So the mental work. All right. So we have 11 things we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to make a huge Huge announcement, Joe. Bigly. Bigly. (laughs) But I think I just want to tee off on what you said, Joe, that was brilliant, and then we'll tell people who this guy Kevin is. Um, We were made for one purpose, and the, the... 
it is clear that if we don't, if we fail to achieve that purpose, we have failed magnificently. We have failed disastrously and we have failed eternally. So if we can't get to heaven because we don't want to pray, then at the end of the day, we just didn't want to get to heaven. And that's what St. Thomas Aquinas says. His, I, I, I can't remember if his sister asked him. Somebody close to him asked him. His sister said, but how do I, how do I become a saint? And he just said, you have to want it. You just have to want it. That's it. Mm. If you want to be a saint, you'll be a saint. So if you want to be a saint, you got to follow these 11 things that we're about to talk about. Yeah. It, it's time to stop being tepid. Boom. Right. Now, look, we all, we, we, we can't appreciate, we can't have a full appreciation for what um, a true relationship in the, in the very truest sense yeah. with God is, right? And, and it's not so much... Your relationship is such a, a modernized term, right? It seems like it's this passing experience and whatnot, but an actual talking with God, right? This is something yeah. that, that started in the Garden of Eden, right? That that Adam talked with God. He walked with God, right? The, the, this is this is very clear in, in Genesis. And that is something as a result of original sin that was then taken away by Adam's ultimate choice to partake of the, the tree of fruit and uh, the tree of wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. And now we have to work through our human frailty to try to find our way back with the grace of God, with the advent of Christ coming down to earth to sacrifice for us. And we have to, to, to reach out and try to grab that back with Christ's grace. And the Prodies will give lip service to this. Okay. The Prodies. The, the Prodies. All right, the Prodies love talking about. Could you spell that for us, please? Just so I feel like after are, you started this, trend, I know, I know, that there's a lot of misspellings. There are some variations, and you know what? I'm going to permit those variations. Okay. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Organic development. Some people use D's. <laughs> some people use T's when they spell Prodi. Look, a Prodi is a person who protests the ultimate authority of the Catholic Church, which is a, a derivative of the authority of God. So a prodi is protesting against God, and we know that. But but one of the things that the prodies give lip service to, Kevin, is this personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm I'm I have a personal friendship with Him. But we're supposed to do that, right? Like we're that's that's legit. They just don't. A they have no idea what they're talking about when they mm -hmm. say that because for them it's a it's an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. They're experientialists, right? At the end of the day, they're experientialists. They don't want to live in objective reality. They want to live in this simulated reality yep. whereby they are um, experiencing their emotions. Right. Endorphins must course through me. Endorphins, yeah. They're, they're to, literally trying to generate a biochemical, physiological reaction to what they're talking about. And when the preaching isn't moving you, and when the, when the music isn't giving you chills, and you don't get a thrill up your leg, like, uh, what's his name on MSNBC, who's retiring now, thanks yes. be to God, um, Chris Matthews, then it at that point, y you move on. You start church shopping and all this stuff. The 11 things we're about to talk about have nothing to do with your emotions because in authentic Catherine, uh, Catholic uh, doctrine, um, your emotions should not be antecedent. They should be, they should not be precedent emotions. They should be antecedent emotions. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So the those are, those are properly ordered emotions. Exactly. Which are good in, the, in and of themselves. You should not be moved by your emotions. Your emotions should be moved by your will. Your will has to come first. So that's what we're going to talk about. Kevin is joining us from somewhere west of the heart of America. You came all the way here to do this show, and we're making a major announcement with you at the end of this show. It's going to change the face of Catholicism in the United States, perhaps around the world. Am I being hyperballistic when I say that, Joe? Hyper, hyper ballistic. Hyper, hyper ballistic. Super ballistic. <laughs> it's super. That's actually better. Super ballistic. Super ballistic. Love it. Yeah. Let's get into it. But I'll take it. You'll take it? <laughs> Why don't you take it? Why don't you take us through the first of these 11 principles of the interior life? Great. We'll jump into the very first one. This is from the book, The Soul of the Apostle, written by Dom Chotard. 
spiritual classic. Maybe we'll just start digging into the specifics by starting with what he starts with, the credo of the interior life. <clears throat> could, could you tell us, Kevin, before, before you launch into those, a little bit about this book? Sure. Yes. False start. Five yard penalty. <laughs> yeah. Go. <laughs> Yellow flag. We <laughs> need Mike, one of those. On Mike. Uh, sure. Yeah. So this book, The Soul of the Apostolate, was written by Dom Chotard. He was one of the heads for the Trappist religious order in the around the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century. Mm-hmm. He traveled around the world. He knew many priests, you know, whether it be those who were priest during the time of the war in France or um, in South America. He was all over. And he saw a great tragedy among priests and among laity, even in the midst of Catholic action, that they lacked deep devotion. They were living activist lives, more of a shallow surface level faith. And this was before Facebook? This was before <laughs> Facebook. This was before Jet. I mean, he was traveling the world when it was actually hard to travel the world. Right. He's, no email. He's, yeah, he's crossing the ocean on a ship. Mm-hmm. How's that for having some downtime? I'd love to have. I'd love to be on a ship with no cell phones. How awesome would that be? Beautiful. I know that's like that's like a, a no, purgatory. No, no for cell some phones. People. No coronavirus. No. <laughs> yeah. None of that. No, uh, you might get scurvy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair. But uh, if, look, every age has its coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. No, but this book, Kevin, okay. Well, let's all, let's both hold up our books and smile into the camera. Look, we have our books. This book sat on the bedside table to Pope St. Pius X. That's why we used his picture in the clickbait that you clicked and you're watching this show. <laughs> if you're listening to the Living the Face show out in, in Podcastville and you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, you're wrong. You done messed up, A.A. Ron. <laughs> <laughs> you need to subscribe to the channel so that we can grow the viewer, the viewership base, the user base, so that we can keep making these videos. We love making these videos. But this book is available anywhere books are sold. You can find it on Amazon. That's where I got mine. Mine is mine is less used than yours, though. Like, you have clearly... <laughs> did you run yours through a dishwasher or something? <laughs> like, is that are these bragging rights here? You love your book. Uh, but this was... I the, sleep with this thing. You do. You, I it's not just my bedside book. This thing is... It is it your goes, pillow. It's like it with goes my pillow. <laughs> inside the sleeping bag with you. That is... Okay. Wow. Um, you remind, don't want to get near I'm that I'm not going to touch the book. I might get the corona. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So this is a this is a significant book, and we're going to talk about these eleven things, and uh, and so we're going to do that in rapid fire mode. This will not be a two hour show. We're going to hit the eleven things. We're going to make our major announcement, but these eleven rules are expounded in the book, and this is going to be revolutionary. We'll put the link to the uh, to the purchase of the book online, um, and here we go. Okay, here we go. Number one, take us, Kevin. <laughs> First truth, supernatural life is the life of Jesus Christ in my soul by faith, hope, and charity. For Jesus is the meritorious, exemplary, and final cause of sanctifying grace. And with the Father and the Holy Ghost, he is the efficient cause in our souls. All right, you got to explain final versus efficient cause here. I think we have to unpack that for for this sentence to make sense. Most people, when they read this book 150 years ago, were classically trained in Thomistic philosophy, so they understood the differences between the final and efficient causes. Tell us in layman's terms, what does that mean? Efficient cause, that which brought it into being final cause, its purpose or end. How's that? Maybe a little bit more more third grader. Yeah, yeah, bring that okay. down. What is the efficient cause of this um, old-fashioned that I'm drinking right now? Uh, the people who made the old-fashioned drink. Okay. So when they put together this... Uh, well, I made the old-fashioned, okay. but I combined Jim Beam and... You just wanted uh, to be an efficient cause. You've Angerosa. never had that title before. That's why. <laughs> it's a great title. I'm all into... You know, we were having this discussion earlier about titles. I almost purchased a Scottish title. Did you know that you can become a lord for forty nine ninety nine on Facebook? Oh, that's awesome. I want to be a lord. <laughs> and and we can't even say what your full name would be. No, no. I, I can't even pronounce it. I don't speak Russian. Lord Mike. For those of you that follow me on Facebook, I have a Russian name. And it's not even a real name. I'm trying to protect my family here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that a caca? What was that? Uh, I, was, I was trying not to be too explicit. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Anyways. 
So the efficient cause, right, is a, you know, a, you, I am the efficient cause of this drink. What is the formal cause of this drink? The f- formal cause would be the essence of what it is. So the old fashioned mm-hmm. itself. Right. Which the old fashioned is uh, whiskey and... Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, maybe you could say that the cup. It's it's easier to use it, the cup. Okay. The, the form of the of the glass is the shape of the glass in a way. It's that's what gives it its form. Okay. Whereas then there's another cause, the material cause, which is the glass, the glass material. Okay. So so you in your own words, this might be a better. We we might might be helpful here. In your own words, say what Dom Chatard is saying here. <clears throat> Sanctifying grace isn't some abstract notion it's not something that just comes out from some um, vague deity in the universe Mm -hmm. it's the person of jesus christ who is the cause of the life of grace in my soul and he is its final end and he is its essence itself that is jesus christ who dwells in me because of sanctifying grace that's a pretty tight-knit relationship um yeah Okay, so you're supposed to be super intimate with our Lord, okay? This is like an intimate relationship, like soul to soul. Like this is, I, I, I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read a part of it again. Jesus is the final cause of sanctifying grace. He is its efficient cause in our souls. I am the way, the truth, and the life, period. If you, you don't have me, you don't have anything. Right. If you don't eat my body, you don't have anything. If you don't drink my blood, I'm not in you, period. And you have no eternal life. So think about it from this perspective. When we talk about the Protestant understanding of a relationship, right? If I say Kevin is my very, very good friend, I don't depend on him as my, he's not my, he's neither my final nor my efficient cause, no, he's in, like your broski. No, just, in fact, he's he's like useful to you. There's a utilitarian right. There's, aspect of it. That's you it. You pull it off the bookshelf when you want to read it, and you put it back on the bookshelf. That's exactly. You say, Kevin, you're there when I need you, and when you're when I don't need you, you're not there. Yeah, exactly. That's what they mean. Yeah. And all these all these proddies that are into the Joel Alstein, you know, prosperity gospel. God, if God loves you, he will give you material goods. He will make you rich. That's how you know that God loves you. That's how you know you're close to Christ because right. he makes you rich. Right. <laughs> Catholics exactly. say it's the opposite of that. Right. So th- this is why when you say, you know, Christ, Christ, my bro. Yeah. It, yeah. Th- this is, I see this... these t-shirts. Jesus is my homie. Oh my God. Jesus is my homie. Are you kidding me? I have more in common with a pagan than I have with someone who wears that t-shirt. Yeah, that, I that, do. That's a fact. I do. Yeah. I feel more at home with the pagans. Mm-hmm. If Jesus is your homie, unsubscribe from the channel right now. Unsubscribe. All right. I, I just want to add, Blessed Marie Eugene, who is sort of the Carmelite of Garigou Lagrange from the 20th century, he he comments on this notion of it's it's more than just a bond, a relationship. Jesus in my soul is a compenetra- compenetration of two beings producing a certain likeness and identity. It leads to divinization, literally, mm-hmm. the life mm-hmm. of Christ. But we can get more into that. Likeness later. of identity. That's a beautiful thing. Okay, number two. We have 11 things. We're going to get through them. Number two, quote, By this life, Jesus Christ imparts to me his spirit. In this way, he becomes the principle of a superior activity which raises me up, provided I do not obstruct it. To think, judge, love, will, suffer, labor with him, by him, in him, and like him. My outward acts become the manifestations of this life of Jesus in me. Okay, that sounds even more intimate than the first one, guys. We're we're, we're going further and further down the proverbial hole. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I, uh, in him and like him, with him, my outward acts, my outward acts. Okay, we're talking about what you do here. Okay, so we've already lost the prodies because mm-hmm. all they do is raise their hands and say amen. What you do, my outward acts become the manifestations of this life of Jesus in me. We've lost them. 
We've lost them already. We've yeah. departed from Protestantism because now we're talking about our works, what we do. Right. We're, we've only we've only reached point two, and now we can't even talk about Protestantism. We have anymore. nothing. In, I know. And what am I going to talk about if we can't <laughs> talk about the Protestants? What am I going to talk about? <laughs> Uh, you got to be a little more creative, Mike. I guess so. I guess so. Wow. Okay, get wow. him a return flight from the heart of America, nonstop service, Back. and don't give him a mask. Don't put a mask on on your Corona flight, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> Headed westbound. Okay, number three. Number three, third truth. Wait, did you have something? Are you going to throw a red flag on me? Um, I, I was going to say, he, he also says that this expression of the interior life is not so much just the habitual interior life that we get if we're simply in the state of grace, but it's, it's a vital living reality that has, to, that, that has to be this intimate contact and union with Christ in our soul. So just saying, I simply stay in the state of grace, that can become uh, lukewarm and damp and soggy. It should be something, a vital living reality um, that that nourishes a soul and leads to life. How many of us pat ourselves on the back because we stayed in the state of grace for a week? How many of us walk into a, the weekly confessional and say to ourselves, wow, I'm only confessing venial sins today. Aren't I a good Catholic? I do that. Sure. How many of us have done that? And we say, Oh, wow, I'm doing well. But you know, I, I haven't killed the grace in my soul this week. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I, have, I haven't completely smothered it with my sins. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely yeah. been stabbing it in the, in yeah, the yeah, face yeah. Yeah. over yeah. and over again. Death by a thousand cuts right. and all this and right. my attachment to venial sins. Right. Uh, which I do have attachments to venial sins. All of us do, mm. unfortunately. Well, there might be somebody listening. To it. Kevin, you probably have no attachment to venial sins. Look at you. You were just so pure. Christine. Well, you know, St. Louis Bertrand, he once, uh, someone came in while he was eating a meal, and they said, they told him, or no, it was maybe it was, it was St. Louis de Montfort, and he said, uh, hey, Louis, your, your dad just died. And he kept eating as if like nothing happened. And they asked, well, why aren't, you, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you upset? And he said, one single venial sin is a million times more offensive to God than anyone's death because that's not actually sinning. One venial sin. Think about mm. that. That's the perspective wow. of the saints. Hashtag perspective. We've all lost people that we've, you know, we've, we've appreciated that were important to us and whatnot, and we have wept yeah. for them. Give us the grace to weep for our sins. Yeah. And that's not to say that we shouldn't have that wow, affection Joe. for um, those we love, but it's still to put in perspective the, the offense that venial sin is to Right, God. it doesn't negate one, it's just in comparison sure. with another. Yeah. Who was the saint? I, I'm putting everyone on the spot here, but we have the Google A's in front of us if we need it. But wasn't there a saint or a blessed who said of her unborn child, she said, God take this child from me rather than allow this child to commit a mortal sin. I would rather you just take this child now. Mm. That was St. Louis, uh, St. King, King Louis, whose mom told him that. Or maybe, maybe it was someone wow. else who said that about their unborn child, but yeah. She that's said, incredible. I'd, I'd rather see you dead at my feet than having committed mortal sin. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's perspective. Right, and that's the perspective that we have to have, and that's that's what you draw out of Catholic uh, theology here. Okay, we let's move on to number three. We got eleven of these things to yep. go through, and if you like this content, if you are getting something out of this show, subscribe to the channel. This is the Restoring the Faith YouTube channel. Click the bell. Joe is pointing at the bell. Now he's drinking his old fashioned. Now he's pointing at the bell. Click the bell right yep. there so that you can get updates whenever we send out new videos. We try to release three videos a week on YouTube. Sometimes we do more. Sometimes we do less. But every Monday, we give you a Living the Faith. Uh, sorry, we don't give you a Living the Faith. We give you full disclosure. Interviews with famous and important people. On Thursdays, we give you Living the Faith. On Saturdays, we give you Fathers and Doctors. We want to give you more, and we're going to talk about all that we're going to give you at the end of the show, but you have to persevere, people, to the end, number three. 
I would be depriving myself of one of the most effective means of acquiring this interior life if I failed to strive after a precise and certain faith in the active presence of Jesus within me. And if I did not try to make this presence within me not merely a living, but an extremely vital reality, you said that, Kevin, and one which penetrated more and more into all the life of my faculties. When Jesus, in this manner, becomes my light, my ideal, my counsel, my support, my refuge, my strength, my healer, Joe, we're relying on him, right? You said this, we're relying on him. This is not like the book you pull off the bookshelf. My consolation, my joy, my love. In a word, my life. I shall acquire all the virtues. Then alone will I be able to utter with sincerity the wonderful prayer of St. Bonaventure, which the church gives me for my thanksgiving after mass. And then he says something in Latin, which I can't translate right now. Transfige dulcissime Domine Jesu. The Lord Jesus Christ transforms me in sweetness. That's amazing. This is not like friendship, right? This is not like, oh, let's be, you know, Joe, we're friends. We're really good friends. We're the kinds of friends that if I needed something at three in the morning, I would call you. You would call me. <laughs> yes. And also, if I'm if we're mad at each other, we scream in each other's faces. We are though we're brothers. This happens. This happened. This happens <laughs> not too regularly. Thanks be to God. But it did happen today yes. already. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, brother. Cheers. But um but that's not the kind of intimacy that we're talking about. My life depends. I love you, bro. But my life doesn't depend on you. And likewise. And that's what we're talking about here. Kevin, this sounds so theoretical. Can you can you bring that? I mean, this is like this, these are flowery. This guy's French, obviously. And <laughs> can you bring this down to like an Eng, like efficiency of English? You know, you know, Pro- Protestant work ethic, Germanic peoples. You know, like can you can you translate this to me? I don't know if I can translate to the Prodies. We'll see. But, oh, uh, I tried. See, fair. that was a good test. He passed. It, he did. He passed he the did. test. Um, Didn't he? Well, I, I, <laughs> I'll take it as a yes. Um, so the way I look at this is basically what is your motive for becoming good? If you're drawn in by a person, their aroma, their way of being just draws you in to being good, right? It's almost like you don't have to think about it. It it just, oh, I want that. It becomes attractive. Whereas if you say, I want to become a good person and I'm going to do this good thing and that good thing and this good thing and that good thing, it's going to be much more of a self-willed sort of, um, you know, self-conquest, sort of like the Stoics, mm. the Stoic philosophy of, you know, don't know emotions and just sort of, you know, thinking about you're going to die and that kind of stuff. And that's all it is. But we have the person of Jesus Christ who is our, you know, he, he is the aroma that attracts mm. us to goodness, to love. And so if we have that initial contact, as I think what this truth is pointing out, then that is going to make that effort of growing in virtue and all of that facilitated. It's going to make it sweet. It's going to make it desirable. Um, and so that, that's what the Christian life gives. Is It's a true living life and, and, and charity and that deep intimacy that our soul is thirsting for. Our Lord says we have that, that, that That's a beautiful point. And there's so many different fathers and doctors of the church that describe this spousal relationship that we should have with Christ, mm. right? Or, you know, that the, that the priest might have with Our Lady, or Christ might have with a nun, or what mm. we would have with Christ e- each one of us, right? And, and the, even the spousal relationship between Christ and the church. This is something that, as as as... as most of us, you know, happen to be wasps and, and, and you know, have this uh, kind of a, a American uh, utility blandness, just uh, sterile. Sterile. Sterile, exactly. yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, approach to this, right? We don't really represent that. But what you just said, Kevin, 
firmly it, uh, it trenches this this attractiveness, right? We talk about, you know, if you're if you're married, you you have a glimpse of what this might be, or if you're a single guy or a single uh, woman who you know desires this. Th- so much more are we supposed to desire that that intimacy mm. with Christ and that dependency as being one with Him. This is what marriage is. This is why Christ made this a sacrament because this is an archetype of the relationship that we should have with Christ in the truest, uh, not concupiscence, right. uh, if, if right. that's a word, relationship, but the, but that the unity that exists there. Yeah, you know, in, in the Old Testament, what do they say when a man consummates with his wife? He knew her. Yes. Right? It's an intimate knowing. There's a difference. You know, our Lord says, at the at the the, uh, the last day, you know, someone will rise and say, "Lord, Lord," and he will say, "Depart from me, for I knew you not." I didn't know you. That's I did right. not know you. Do mm, you know? I never knew you. Do you know? Yeah, exactly. Do you know Jesus truly living mm. in the Eucharist? Do you know the living reality that are the doctrines and dogmas of our beautiful traditional faith? I want to. Fantastic. I want to bring our Lady in to the discussion at this juncture because what we're really talking about is how perfectly lovable our Lord is, was. And as she knelt at the foot of the cross and saw him put to death in an ignominious fashion, she would have been keenly aware of the injustice happening there because she, more than anyone, would have known how perfectly lovable he was. And what a tremendous loss it was for humanity to witness what happened at Calvary. You want to talk about getting close to our Lord? Maybe start with getting close to our lady. Maybe start there. Because of anyone when when you you talk about the soul the the sword piercing her soul, mm. that's the moment when the sword pierces her soul because she knows what is happening. She sees it and she allows it to happen in her fiat and in her permissive will in a way she says yes i will consent to allowing these men here to do something that is unthinkable to the lord and you know you kind of rope in when you go we all go to confession if you're watching this channel you go to confession hopefully you go more regularly than at least monthly hopefully you go As often as possible, you have to do an examination of conscience to get anything out of it. Most of us, when we go to confession, we 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 think about our sins in terms of the Ten Commandments. And why does it make so much sense that the first commandments are all about our Lord and taking his name in vain? When I read this, this is the third truth, which we're going to accelerate here. When I read this, my love, my consolation, my healer, my refuge, my strength, my support, my counsel, my joy, my life, my everything. Jesus Jesus is my homeboy? Jesus is my homeboy. It's too casual. How does that make any sense? No gravity to that. There's nothing going on there. And worse, the blasphemes, the blasphemes against our Lord. How can you possibly bring yourself to take our Lord's name in vain? That's a Ten Commandments. That's a commandment. You shall not take my name in vain. How can you possibly take his name in vain? If he is your life, your consolation, your justice. Yeah, you're you're showing self-hatred at that point. Yeah, and to your point about Our Lady, which religious order do you think of when you think of the, the intellectual religious order? Well, well, okay. At which point in time are we uh, talking? <laughs> the, the Yo, here, uh, a, uh, a Dominican and a Jesuit go into a bar, and uh, uh, yeah, and um, and a pagan comes out. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, 
let me rephrase that. Uh, which religious order is known for being the order of study? In Dominicans. Pre- in pre- yeah, Dominicans. Okay. Yeah, 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 Dominicans. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yep. And so the Dominicans, St. Dominic, he knew that. He knew that this is, we're going to attract this sort of this crowd. Is charism, yeah. Right? But what do they do at the end of their day? They all process to the statue of Our Lady, get down on their knees, and they chant the Salve Regina. Because he knew that they had to have that deep, true, personal devotion. And Our Lady is the exemplar way to Christ to achieve that. Boom. That's it. Period. Um, does anyone else want to read number four? Go you want for to read it. fourth truth? Fourth truth. Fourth, fourth truth. Oh, okay. All right, here again. Oh, you have it on your phone. Yeah, I have it on my phone. Here you go. This uh, is the digital yeah, I think, age. I know, I know, I know. This is the digital age. I'm not what? trying to. We, we have the shortcut that. version here. Oh, you have the short. Oh, cause the, I've been reading the longer ones. Yes, yeah. Yeah. right, right. Uh, but I'm getting into it. <laughs> it is. It's You're, awesome. Yeah. So I'm just gonna. I'm gonna read the, the the broken down version here. Okay. Fourth truth. In proportion to the intensity of my love for God, my supernatural life may increase at every moment by a new infusion of the grace of the active presence of Jesus in me. Mm. In proportion to my intensity. In proportion to my intensity. We thought we were going to stop talking about the Protestants at this point. Well, you talked about tepidity. <laughs> yeah. You did. You brought yep. up to the... You know what it says in, ap- in the apocalypse? The tepid shall be vomited. Vomited from the from the mouth of our Lord. Yeah. The... I. I've heard he spew you out of his mouth. I have heard I have heard uh, theologians say that it is better to hate God than to be tepid. If you're just this tepid, look. If you're this Americanist, and we're going to get to Americanist heresy, okay? So don't you worry. All right, I'm that's, just that's number you eleven, out. Mike. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's coming. It's, it's coming before the announcement, but after, yeah. But if you're this guy that's like I. You know, I want to love our Lord, but I want to do it like in a socially acceptable, like non oppressive, gluten free environment. <laughs> okay. You're tepid. Yeah. You're tepid. Well, but, but the question becomes why? Why is tepidity the worst? Yeah. Why is it the worst? Right. Because, because the, 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 the pagan who hates God, there's a level of a lack of an understanding, right? Because yeah. if if God appeared to a pagan right now, he'd be like, "Oh, don't hurt me." Okay, all right, all right, I get yeah, it, yeah, I get it, I get, I get it. it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. The the person who is not tepid, the, but the, is the you know firm Catholic who who knows, who has the awareness, and has the good enough sense to actually chase that. Right. But your person who is tepid knows what's right and refuses to lift a, to 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 stretch stretch a hamstring to get there right it's laziness right it's sloth there's a reason again we we talked about this in in previous shows about and we call out various different you know uh uh, uh sin uh, uh cart not cardinal sins um, oh yeah capital sin, sins capital yeah. sins yeah this is sloth but it's finest and this is why yeah. sloth is so horribly it's evil de- it's a deadly sin deadly it's a deadly sin i would uh, i i I don't say things that are controversial. I really don't. I don't. I don't. I try not to, okay? I gave you that one. Yeah. (laughs) But I would say that sloth is perhaps the greatest sin that afflicts us in postmodernist America, USA today. Because we live in a technologist environment. We We really don't have to work that hard. We have a machine sure. that washes our dishes. We drop off our clothes at the dry cleaner. We have a cleaning lady that comes to our house. I mean, like, how hard is our life? You know what I mean? Yeah. How hard is our life? And we have an abundance of free time. Some people use their free time to watch the Restoring the Faith media channel. That's a good thing. Some people use their free time to Netflix and chill. That's a bad thing. Okay, yep. so we live in an environment where sloth is so accessible. I mean, if you if you are in sub-Saharan Africa, I don't think you have a lot of time for sloth. Because what do you need for sloth? You need like an abundance of free time. 
to be right, lazy. Right. You, you, you know, you're not living on the edge at every single moment. That's yeah. where sloth comes comes out. This is why right. it's important to have routines. That's it. You have to have a routine. You have to have a rule so of life. Okay. That's where you come in. I'm pointing at you. All right. I'm pointing at you, Kevin. But he's not going to tell you yet. <laughs> That's right. You guys gave me so many say things that, I wanted to I say. I know. But... <laughs> I know. You can say some stuff, <laughs> but you have to save the big stuff till the end because we really are making a major announcement. We're not pulling your leg here, people. We're making a major announcement. Just don't... teasing you. And please don't fast forward, okay, because you're going to miss out on all this stuff too. Look... You're not going to read this book, The Soul of the Apostolate. You're just not. Okay, this is hard stuff. Developing a spiritual life is hard stuff. Prayer, praying, prayer, is hard. It's the hardest work. Yeah, the, the book just tells you how to do it. It doesn't do it for you. It's not a how-to. You don't get to just actually read it and then be like, I have a spiritual life now. This I is read not, The Soul of the Apostolate. You, you, this is not going to be found in the self-improvement section of Barnes & Noble, okay? <laughs> this is not going to be sitting on the shelf alongside, like, how to flip houses, <laughs> okay? Dave Ramsey show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, Dave Ramsey's on to something because debt is evil and usury is evil and the people who are behind usury are evil, but um, that's not what we're talking about. All right. I got one. I, I got to say something about this truth before we, I know we got to accelerate. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So this point about the lukewarm, I think the reason to your question, Joe, the, the answer to your question about why is it that they are the lukewarm are more despicable than those who are just flat evil. It's because would you rather who who is more despicable, your enemy or a fake friend? Mm, Someone who well betrays said. you. Ooh, you I, say you're my friend. You thing. say I believe this. Okay, you know what? I hope my wife watches this episode because this is exactly what she preaches in terms of raising the children. Honestly, honestly, I'm no joke. We used to live in the belly of the beast in Los Angeles. And if you live in Los Angeles and you're listening to the show, you know, my condolences, like you're behind enemy lines, okay? But at least the one good saving grace in LA is you knew who your enemies were. They were out in the open. You go to Trader and, Joe's. And it was everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and it's everybody. But you go to Trader Joe's, they're dressed like witches. Mm-hmm. They're dressed like vampires. You know who they are. They yep. identify themselves. They're wearing a uniform. Yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. They're wearing a uniform. Yeah. The traitor at Tu Brute, the traitor mm. is the bigger evil. He's the one that's wearing the same toga you are. That's right. Yeah, there's a, there's a man who lived in China, I believe, and he, um, or maybe, maybe he was either a priest or I can't remember. He was a, he was a devout Catholic at least. And he was about to be martyred by the communists. Mm. And somehow he got off and he got away and he was willing to be martyred. He wanted it. He desired it. He came to the United States. And it was here where he was practicing that he ended up losing the faith because he was bombarded with the lukewarmness that surrounded him. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The indifference of modern society was more powerful than the communist regime to destroy yeah, the thing that yeah, was most yeah. important. Not his physical life, yeah. but his interior spiritual life. They figured that out, too. Mm. The enemy has figured that out. I mean, yeah. in, in the early 20th century, you know, they were they were pleased if they could just, like, incite a communist uprising. Now they know they have to be much more subtle. Well, and, and, and who who is the archetype? Who is the archetype for us, for tepidity he wasn't always tepid but he's a saint he is the ultimate example that christ during his passion used as the example for this tepidity for this lukewarmness saint peter of course that's it of course he said that he knew him at least at one point yeah. right yeah, for yeah. basic for for in 3 years he said he knew the guy was around Christ and whatnot and then when it came down brass tacks denied him 3 times I don't know him I never knew him I don't know him but you said you were his friend No 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 I I'm, I'm not I'm not his friend you're mistaken you're you're the one with the problem you're lying Exactly 
So the, we, now we can understand why uh, St. Peter would uh, had had canals literally in his face. He's noted in, in, in Scripture as having from canals in his face from the tears mm. that he shed yeah. um, during this time. He was an emotional guy, though, you know? I love St. Peter. He was hot or cold. The, the Prodies would love talking with him. They love him, <laughs> wouldn't they? Yeah. The Prodies would love well, St. Peter. Maybe not, maybe the, not the whole papacy thing. Yeah, no. yeah, he's the first pope. <laughs> no, their whole pro- yeah, the Prodies would love him until they figured out that he had the keys. They yeah, like, what does the keys mean? Is that like some kind of like metaphor? <laughs> I, I'm a literalist in the Bible except for John 6 and except for the keys. Yeah. I feel like St. Peter gets a bad rap. But, you know, you hey. You feel. Yeah, I, I feel it. There. Oh, I feel boy, it. I saw what you did there. That was amazing. <laughs> Are we at number five? Five. I think so. The triple concupiscence caused by original sin and increased by every one of my actual sins establishes elements of death that militate against the life of Jesus in me. Concupiscence. Concupiscence. We've been talking about our emotions. And we've talked about our concupiscible appetites on this show. And if you're a sanguine of the four types, it's the most difficult for you. I feel for you. I think I'm sitting across from two sanguines right now. And oh, I've- come on. <laughs> Choleric sanguine. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I can, I can speak yeah, that language. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> we got three sanguines in here. Just because I'm primarily a sanguine does not... Uh, Listen, Saint, we're in good company. St. Peter, we're just talking about him. That's very why I love St. Peter. They're like, this very is like sanguine. the only hope that I've got. Okay. okay? All right. All right. Come on. He's like a ping pong ball, but he's hot and cold and hot. But, but, but the truth is, look, I'm going to read part of this again. The triple concupiscence caused by original sin establishes elements of death, okay? And in exact proportion as these elements develop in me, they diminish the exercise of that life, okay? To the extent that we are governed by our lower passions, by our most base instincts, There's death. The stench of death is what this is talking about. To the extent that we reduce ourselves to the level of beasts, of animals, and we are just eating the... The dung that is placed yeah, we're, in front we're of us. We're catfish. We're we're bottom feeders. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you you um you, th- this is where you kind of have to engage a little phil- philosophy in this regard, right? We have to talk about the intellect, the will, and the passions. God created us in His image and likeness. So we were created. These are these are not results. Not neither of these three things are results of original sin, right? So God created us with an intellect that receives and processes the mm-hmm. information. Yep. The will that actually acts on that information appropriately or should, right? Chooses. It, it, it just chooses, right? It, it's neutral, right? Itself. And then the passions, which are the, essentially, not, not to, I don't want to break it down to a biological function, but it, it's closely knit with the biological function in that it is the, the, endorphins the mm-hmm. the feelings yeah. that that we get as a result of that choice of the will yeah we are hardwired to survive correct so we're hardwired to eat mm-hmm. we're hardwired to reproduce mm-hmm. we're hardwired to, to self-preserve mm-hmm. we're hardwired to uh have a herd mentality okay these are the thing I, these are the concupiscible appetites right. these are our appetites you place a pizza in front of an italian it's happening. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if it's Lent, Brogation Day, Ember Day. doesn't matter. How about the lasagna? <laughs> oh, boy, buddy. <laughs> I'm not Italian at all, to my knowledge, yeah. but I freaking love lasagna, man. I do. <laughs> I do. Um, but to the extent that you are governed by your concupiscence, elements of death... That's what it's talking about. Elements of death. You have to overcome. And you said that you said it. The power of the soul 
which can overcome the concupiscible appetites is your will. Your will. Your will chooses the good or the evil. Mm -hmm. But either way, it chooses. And that is how you will be judged. Our Lord, as you said, Joe, did not create evil. Okay? Evil was brought about by man. Mm -hmm. But he does allow us to be tempted. And to the extent that you capitulate to that temptation, that is on you. And that is on your app. So this is, I think, Kevin, is where you you can really kind of unpack this thought about developing a discipline, an interior discipline, which which is more powerful than your base appetites as as a human species, as an animal, right? Right, yeah. This is talking about the effects of original sin. And th that notion, it's sort of a bad word. In It's been a bad word for uh, really decades in the mainstream that we have original sin. We've had this humanistic psychology of, oh, human nature is just all good. It's all good, There's, bro. Mm -hmm. It's all good, man. You know, yeah. just, yeah, like the Coloradans. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you speak Colorado He's very Colorado. well. I do. Well, wow. I can you're say I've been around a few. whole second language. Wait, is Colorado in your first language or second language? Uh, you guess. <laughs> <laughs> he said Mank. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard. I heard Mank. <laughs> That's a combination of like five different dialects. Yeah. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. No, but uh, but it, it's it's but important. You're, right. it, you're 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 appealing to the will, right? And the and and the will. The, Look, the intellect is not actually a hard thing to appeal to because it still it still depends on natural law, which is already embedded in us, right? Yeah. So it already has a tendency towards something. The will is purely neutral. It, of, of, all, of, the, of the three aspects that we have as human beings, the will is purely neutral. Only... It cannot, however, choose what is uncomfortable, right? Because it's not, that's not how the will is, it, it works. The will has to be disciplined. It has to be brought to bear. But the will, will, makes, will makes a choice, but it has to be brought to bear. It has to be brought to heal. And that is why the will is what's so important. Because there's so many people that you would say that, that they know what's right. But it's just too hard. And, it, and, and actually, it's, it's not even to say that it's purely neutral. It's actually probably the, the one. It's the one that gets caught in the middle between what the passions are saying and what the intellect is saying. The intellect is screaming, you can't do that. And the passions are like, oh, no, come on, man, come on. And it's stuck right in the middle, the poor will. And the only way that, the, the, that you're actually going to end up doing what you need to get done is by disciplining the will. That's it. And that is primarily what separates us from the beast because yes. the beast doesn't have the ability to contradict its own nature. The beast doesn't have the ability to contradict what its passions are telling it to do. You put food in front of a dog, it's going to eat it, period, end of story. The yeah. dog is going to eat the food, especially if it's like, you know, steak. You throw a steak in front of a dog, the dog is going to eat it. You put a steak in front of a Catholic on a Friday... The Catholic is to say, I want that thing. I want that piece of meat so badly, but I know that for the good of my soul, I cannot eat it, and I'm going to make this sacrifice for God. That is the, what differentiates us from the beast, and it's the will, consequently, is how we're going to be judged by our Lord. Yeah, and, and I would add, this whole book is a continual ascent and descent between gravity of realizing that we have to discipline ourselves and we're fighting against sin and we're trying to save our soul and we're trying to save others, other souls to the heights, the levity from gravity to levity of call to the supernatural divine life. Another clear distinction that we have from the beast is that we have the capax dei, that we can be given grace to be elevated to the divine life, to participate in God's inner life. Perfect. Uh, and so that's what we're going to hear about. And number six is closely related to this. Number six is talking about, look, if I don't overcome my passions, my intellect will be blinded. 
My intellect will be blinded. How many times have we actually talked about this, you know, in Catholic circles? Your intellect, your understanding, in other words, which is the mm-hmm. likeness of God, which is what we share with the angels. We're, the angels are pure spirit. They have understanding and will. We have understanding and will. Our understanding, we define it as intelligence. But this says, number six, if I'm not faithful in the use of certain means, my intelligence will become blind and my will too weak to cooperate with Jesus. My intelligence will be blind. There's a famous story about St. Thomas Aquinas where the people around him, I forget if it was his, his immediate family or his friends or whatever, they were they were saying that, like, you're way too intellectual, you know? Like, I, 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 you know, I want to tempt you out of this. And they brought in parental advisory warning. Parental advisory. A woman of ill repute, maybe. Yeah. They brought in a whore. Sorry. <laughs> and they threw her in the room with him to try to try to bring him down to their level. And what did he do? He chased her out with like a with like a pickaxe too or something. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And he was like, "No, get out." Because It wasn't a pickaxe. He reached into the fireplace and grabbed a log. That was on fire. fire. A log on fire. Even better. Yeah. Chased right? Get not away the from word me. on fire. The log on fire. No, right? the, yeah, word yeah. Is that the, the word on fire is definitely like te- <laughs> tepidity 101. But um, St. Thomas Aquinas, he did that. Why was his intellect so sharp? It's because he was not subject to his lower passions, to his concupiscible appetites. And he knew that he had, if, if he had succumbed to those lower passions, to the concupiscence of you know his nature of wanting to reproduce and wanting to propagate the species and all these things the temptation that was thrown in front of him if he had succumbed to that temptation he knew that he would not be able to write accurately about our lord right and and the thing is uh, and, and you we, we can talk about various different things that went through but right the the importance of protecting yourself from an occasion of sin don't even know necessarily if you're actually going to dive into that, yeah. but you keep an occasion of sin, right? The 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 proximity of that the possibility, because Tom Saint Thomas Aquinas knew that we are all capable of everything, but for the grace of God, says Saint Philip, Philip Neri, goes up, go I, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I I'm also capable of any of the sins that are committed against Christ. So you want to make sure that you have the greatest amount of of uh, distance from any possibility. Yeah. Should I I think, can, can you imagine the very variety of thoughts that could have possibly gone through his head? Oh, okay, well, maybe they're, they're, they're going to tempt me and instead I'm going to convert her, you know, or something like that, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Y- you know, just, <laughs> yeah, sure. you, you know. Yeah, sit down, lady. Uh, let me let me show, let me me tell you about our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. Do you have a personal relationship with him? <laughs> That's the question. Clearly uh, okay, not. Right? So, okay. And now this is a logical progression as you get into number seven. So we talked about number five, and it talks about concupiscence and con- the concupiscence of original sin, and it creates death in your soul. Number six is, and furthermore, furthermore, if you are subject to the, that concupiscence, then your will is... Is, becomes um, in, invalid, um, and your intelligence becomes darkened. Uh, but then number seven says, look, you're always moving in one direction or the other. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. Yep. But the one thing we know about the spiritual life is there's no such thing as steady state. You do not stay the same from day to day. You are either choosing to get better or you're choosing to get worse. But either way, it's a choice. That's what number seven says. And you'll start crawling with venial sins if you choose to get worse. If you're not getting better, you will fall into that tepidity and you will be crawling with venial sins. Kevin, could you talk a little bit about, right? We we think, like, like Mike started the show off with, about the difference between venial sins and mortal sins, right? People don't really feel like venial sins are that big of a deal. They're just like minor transgressions. Whereas the mortal sin is like, whoa, okay, all right, yeah, 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 yeah. You're okay. Dead. You're dead. I, I'm going to go to confession now, I promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, is, there, is, is there any... Give us um, some perspective. Perspective. How does on, God view a venial sin? Yeah. 
Well, let's think of it in terms of that light, living vital reality in our soul. If you believe that the person of Jesus Christ dwells in you, when you're committing especially a deliberate venial sin, mm-hmm. you're basically saying shove off. That's what you're doing. I, and I, so when you yeah. come to prayer and you, you can't come to someone face to face like that without repenting of that. So you're, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to make that act and then you're not actually going to come back and pray. And so you're going to say, oh, it's no big deal. And you're going to justify it in your head. And then you're going to do one more and another and another. And you're not going to be willing to come face to face with him. Mm. And so your confessions, if you do them, are going to be null of true contrition. And it's going to, it slowly snowballs. That's the whole point of this, especially when you're falling into activism. It snowballs because you're not living from the true source of what our faith is all about. I I heard somebody... uh, quote a saint, and I'm not going to be able to say who who it was. I, I don't remember which saint it was that they were referring to, but they they likened it. It was in, in a married context, but he was talking about the difference between venial sin and, and, and immortal sin. He said, venial sin is like slapping your wife across the face. A mortal sin is like stabbing your wife. So if you put that into the context of what it is when you commit a venial sin and slapping Christ across the face while he's sitting, you know, sitting there crowned with thorns, struck by a reed, struck by a reed. That's what you're doing with a venial sin. Mortal sin, you're putting nails in his hands and hanging him up to asphyxiate. That's Mm. the difference between a venial sin and a mortal sin. Mm. Just, it it was very dramatic, but very clear example about, uh, about that. We, we tend to be so uh, focused on, like, efficiency in this country. We tend to want the greatest amount of productivity for the least amount of effort. And so it's very easy for us to fall into this mindset where we say, I just need to do the minimum to get to heaven. And so it's very easy to, to, to then kind of fall into this fallacy where you say, venial sins are okay mm. because they won't deprive me of heaven. Right. If you want to know what purgatory is like, check out our show about purgatory. It is not somewhere you want to go. We talk for 90 minutes about how awful purgatory is. We tell stories about saints that have seen it, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and frankly wish they didn't have the t-shirt. And we also talked about hell, which, eh, as we know, is is a lot worse. Yeah, hell, it, hell is a lot worse. And that mindset is depriving you of greater glory in heaven for all of eternity. Yeah, that, okay. All right, so that, that's a point worth resting on. The Your place in heaven. Christ has a predetermined place. There, you have a place when he, before he even created you, before he created mankind, he has a designated spot for you. I don't know if we have a really a real appreciation for. Well, as long as I make it into heaven, do, 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 does that really matter where I rank in that? hierarchy yeah i mean i think a lot of people are like ah i'm cool with like living in a shanty town in heaven <laughs> like other people can have the mansions <laughs> right. you know like i'll t- i'll live in the trailer park of heaven <laughs> i can wear a wife beater <laughs> but if you miss i mean you're talking about like i want to do the minimum but There's- if you err in er. that if you err yeah error err, err we're from Texas. <laughs> There's a very wide margin you of can say, error. Okay, yeah. So, okay, if you if you E R R in that calculation, you're done. You're done. Toast. Like you want you want like a margin of safety on this thing. You know what I mean? You want some standoff. Nope. Yeah. None of this crawling in the back door. And and P S P S. If that is your mindset, which it so often is. Yeah. When you're in the purgative phase of your interior life, all you're trying to do is avoid consequences. You're just trying to say, I don't want to go to hell. It's not about love. 
It's not about doing things for our Lord because you love him. It's about doing things that won't offend him or fail or, you know, refraining from doing things that will offend him because you're afraid that daddy's going to bring the stitch in and whip you. Yep. And I'm sorry. We're not toddlers anymore. It's time to grow up. You're a man now. You cannot be governed by whether or not daddy's going to go out and get a stitch and whip you. Mm -hmm. It works for some time and it's a phase that we all have to go through. But if you can't graduate from that phase, if you can't move into the unitive and illuminative stages of the interior life, then what, what can we do for you? You can't enter heaven, heaven without that. You have to be purged of that. That's it. And it's way worse than purgatory, man. It's way worse. I'd rather... You know what? <laughs> I love old fashions. I do. Yep. But if you sat here, Joe, and told me, looked me dead in the eye and said, you know what? You can skip purgatory if you skip old fashions. I'd be like, done. Why'd you have to start with that? Because I was about to start drinking Kevin's. Oh, can you, you want to split it? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. pour it. <laughs> Let's go halvesies on it. <laughs> in case you're wondering out there in Podcastville, why Kevin makes so much more sense right now, why his why his words are so much more SAT than Joseph's and eyes. Joseph's and eyes? Eyes. Eyes. The eyes have it. The A's don't. Yeah. Number eight. Okay, so we've been talking about all these negative things, like what happens if you fail to do these things and it's going to darken your reason and it's going to really be terrible for you. Number eight. Here we get to more of a positive statement. My interior life will be no better than my custody of my heart. My custody of my heart. A habitual or at least frequent anxiety to preserve all my acts as they arrive from everything that might spoil their motive or their execution. We're talking about our hearts here now, okay? Before we were talking about like us succumbing to our passions and, you know, the, the similarities we have with the beasts and the dissimilarities that we have with the beasts. Now we're talking about when our Lord was questioned, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, it is your heart. It is your heart that I want. Break, break it down, Kevin. I think the best way to look at this truth is to look at the notion of recollection, which is destroyed by distraction. <laughs> <laughs> Go is ahead. It, Go for, ahead, Joseph. No, 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 no. no, no for those who are... It's already done. I, I, recollection I, I is will, gone. I will, I will if allow you're my... listening in Podcastville <laughs> and you're wondering why Joseph started laughing... When Kevin was trying to say something serious is because Mike jumped in and literally stole half of Kevin's old fashioned. More while, than half. While, while Kevin was talking about <laughs> distractions. <laughs> distractions. Okay. What, what does that mean practically, Kevin? Right. Okay. So th this notion of recollection is one that comes from the great spiritual wealth that our Catholic faith offers. St. Teresa talks about it in a way where it's like, where is our soul going and why am I going there? It's, my, it's the custody of my heart of what is its ultimate end. One really practical way to think about this would be, let's say you knew that you had to remember something. Like, what's the last time where you're like, I just, I cannot forget this if I forget this. Everything's going to go to heck. 60 minutes ago. Okay. So whatever that thing was, you're like, it's, it's constantly on your mind. You're like, I can't mm -hmm. forget this. I shouldn't forget this. This is really important. Mm -hmm. That's what our presence with our Lord and our soul should be like. Think about that. Have you gone through five hours of your day without even thinking that our Lord is there with you? I mean, that happens. You know, we, that happens to us. Yep. Like this is the most important reality in the whole universe that we have God dwelling in our soul and we forget that and we lose sight of the importance of that. Recollection is continually keeping that as like, nope, this, this is really important. I can't forget this is really important. That's what recollection is. So it's this habitual recollection that is going to foster that custody of the heart to keep our heart loving God above all things and loving our neighbor as ourselves. We need context and we need to 
remember the the in con in in contrast with the whole you know Christ is my bro kind of situation to actually be able to envision yourself in the heavenly court okay for example in um in confession there was an old school way of confessing and you would literally say, I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary the Virgin, to Blessed Michael mm-hmm. the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to all the, uh, the Blessed Apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints that have sinned through thought, word, and deed. You literally, in this old school way of confession, which was based, based around this concept of interior life, of interior prayer, of this, of, of this methodology by which we were able to communicate with heaven through the sacraments, in confession, you would conf- this old school methodology yeah. Yeah. by confessing. You would place yourself in the court, the judgment, the courtroom. If you were like going in for a speeding ticket, for example, I'm standing in front of the judge and the bailiff and the you know the the, the, the notary or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You you used to place yourself literally in this courtroom with all these notable individuals, starting with God himself, with Our Lady, with the apostles, with the angels and whatnot, and you call down upon yourself this accusation, I have done this, please have mercy on me, God. You're the chief prosecutor. Exactly. Nowadays, you can just show up and say, bless me, Father, forgive me, Father, but... And it's now so you can go. Funny. Yeah. It's so funny because when you get it, when you kneel into a confessional and you say, Confidio Deo Omnipotente, and it, you can almost like, uh, on the other side, you can hear it because they're like, okay, he's going to say the whole confidio. And that's a perfectly valid way to go sure. to confession. You say the confidio and then you stop at a certain point and then you say the, you know, you, you, you say your sins and whatever. But there's a reason why that was the way that you went to confession because you're right, Joe, you place yourself in a courtroom of the heavenly court and the jury is, is the choir of saints. Okay. It's right. all of them. Everybody's watching. They're all sitting there and the prosecution is you. Mm-hmm. And I guess your defense counsel is you're like your guardian angel. <laughs> You yeah, know, he's it's nowhere like, to be found. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I recuse myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watched this happen. I'm a material witness. And, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I did what I could, Your yeah. Honor. Um, no, it's true. It's, yeah. it's absolutely true. And that leads us into number nine, the ninth truth. According to the soul of the apostolate, the ninth truth of, these, of the uh, interior spiritual life. Jesus Christ reigns in a soul that aspires to imitate him. And this imitation has two different degrees, okay? The first is the soul that strives to become indifferent to creatures, okay? We're talking about perfect uh, indifference, okay, to creatures. And then the second is the soul that shows more readiness in doing things that are contrary to its nature. So in the first part, we're talking about detachment. And the second part, we're talking about overcoming overcoming our habitual sins, you know, our nature, our fallen nature. And um, we, we've, we've, we've touched on these two points heretofore previously in the first eight. But number nine brings it home. It says, Jesus Christ reigns in the soul that aspires to imitate him. And the only way you can imitate him is to be detached from his own creatures and you know what's funny when you go to like one of these Ignatian spiritual retreats and you're silent for five days and you hear like you start to hear about all the various creatures and you're just like, wow, time is a creature. Technology is a creature. This book is a creature. My wife is a creature. How do you cultivate perfect Christian detachment from from time itself? You know, like that's a meditation. Yeah, and this is where the true, the soul of the apostle, the soul, the interior life in the soul is so critical that we are given that life of Christ in the soul where we can come to meditation and mental prayer where 
we enter into the deep intimacy of God because we can't detach ourselves fully from everything and from ourselves. Mm. The way that St. John of the Cross describes it, it's like we have these branches in this early purgation of our passions and we cut off the branches, but the trunk and the roots remain. And that's the, tr- that's the deeper, real purgation of our pride and our vanity and our selfishness and egocentrism that has to be rooted out because it's false. God is at the center of our souls, not ourselves. God is deeper in me than I am to myself, St. Augustine says. So we have to, we have to see that it's got to be God who purges me of all of these faults. And, and at, at the end of the day, I want to strive for that. And if that's truly my goal, then God will come in and fill. He'll be the living waters that, that you know, it's called passively he works on the soul. Mm-hmm. But we have to desire that, first of all. If we're not disposed for that, that's not going to happen. We can't do it on our own. But if we're not fertile, as we were saying, if we're sterile, it's not going to happen. You know, we're doing this, uh, or we're hosting specifically this conference on the social kingship of Christ. And we are, uh, you know, having this take place in our studio and whatnot, because this is very, very important because Christ should be the king in every person's life. This level where we are so attached to being politically correct and, and intending to each and every single person that might take offense with what we say. We don't say the truth spe- so that we can hurt other people. It's because we honor Christ as our king. That's that's our focus. Yes. The focus is not about condemning people sure. down and sure. pushing them down because we despise no, them and we think point. we're better than they are. Yes. I, and, and I bring up the prodies. Not necessarily to yeah. say to draw contrast between we love them. truth and darkness or whatever. Which is which is a valid point. Yeah. But it but you're right. It's not because we're saying, Oh, uh, thank God you know, like like the Pharisees, oh thank goodness I'm not like these people sitting behind me and like mm-hmm. pews five right. through twenty. Okay, I sit in the first five pews. Like th- that's not what we're doing here. We're just trying to draw like, illuminate the contrast so that you can say, look, the, one is truth, one is error. Right. And you have to point out and I, error. And I'm not going to to preserve my attachment to these people because, well, I want to be nice. Yeah. And so I, I'm atta- so attached to them and, and not wanting to, to hurt them or, yeah. to, or yeah. to, to cause yeah. them any hurt or whatnot. I'm attached to Christ. When you're attached to Christ, you don't have any fear. There's, there's an old Latin saying, fac recti nec time. Fear, uh, fear nothing. Do what is right, mm. right? That th- this is the the um, I'm sorry. Do right, fear nothing. Fuck right, Nick Do 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 right, fear nothing. This is the point of that, and you're going to offend an entire generation of people for doing this. But this is this is doing what this commandment tells us to do in the interior life. Is we hold up. Christ as our king and we recognize him for what he is and we're willing to defend him not the LGBT you know individual yeah. this or the abortionist that or wow that might hurt them Christ is your king and you're standing out there trying to protect them when you should be defending your 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 uh king and the yeah that, that that's it that's it this is leading us towards Numbers 10 and 11, where we do address head on this error of Americanism because the the heart, the root of the American heresy, the Americanist heresy, I think is... It's a real heresy, by the way, just so we're clear. If you're Catholic, this is a real heresy. So this is not some anti-American... No, no, we love America. Look, no. You're in the heart of America. We're in the heart of America. (laughs) I'm not from the heart of America, so... Well, neither of us are from the heart of America either. We just got here as quickly as we could. (laughs) But, but, uh, you know, look, I've said this in prior shows, and I have to say it because people, like, accuse us of being anti-American or whatever. I swore an oath to defend and protect... The, the Constitution of the, Ameri- of the United States of America. And if we could just live by that Constitution, I think 
both St. Thomas, Aquinas, and I would be okay with that. It wouldn't It'd perhaps be tolerable. It wouldn't be the ideal, but it would be fine, right? We don't even live by that constitution, so what the heck are we talking about, right? But the point is, is that Rome can formally condemned. Um, not even a hundred years ago, the error of Americanism. And I think in my own words, the heart of the Americanist heresy is really two points. And I'm just going to elucidate one of those points now. And it's basically to go along, to get along. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to conform what I believe about the eternal uh, salvation of my soul to what everyone else around me believes. And I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to cause a scene. I don't want to, you know, I just want to be kind of like, okay with her. It's like, we're, mm-hmm. I'm okay. You're okay. Mm-hmm. You, do, you do your thing. I do it's my thing. It's all good, man. It's all good, man. <laughs> we got make. <laughs> it's all good. You do you. I do me. I'm not going to judge you. Why would I judge you? Don't judge me. Though, in fact, the only thing that's worth judging is judgmentalism. Right. Right? The only... To say that something is right or wrong is itself wrong. Yeah, That's exactly. the Americanist heresy. You, you it's don't relativism. even need to actually say you're doing the thing wrong. So if somebody's living, you know, yeah. cohabitating with somebody, and you say it's wrong to cohabitate, then apparently that means that you're judging this person. And they'll be like, you're judging me. No, I just said that cohabitation is wrong. You're cohabitating. You, you draw your own conclusion, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. That's the that's the that's really the the heart of the Americanist heresy. And so, when you look at this and you say, "Am I striving to overcome indifference? Am I, you know, am I trying to overcome my fallen, sinful nature?" That doesn't even apply anymore. That doesn't even apply because if you're more focused about not offending the people around you, you can never look interiorly at your life and say, am I overcoming my fallen human nature? To your point, Joe, if you just cling to the cross, you cling to Christ the King, all that other stuff is going to work itself out. Yeah, you're going to piss people off. You will. You're going to offend people. You're going to hurt people's feelings. You're going to ruffle feathers. You're going to have people walk out on you. You're going to have people cut you out of their life. I've been cut out of people's wills. You, you, you're going to, you're going to lose some people along the way. Okay. Yeah. But we're not supposed to have the attachment to that. But they're creatures. Yep. And we already talked about attachment to creatures and detachment from creatures. Yeah, and so the American heresy, how it uh, manifests itself, was there was a cardinal who was going around basically saying we don't need contemplative religious orders anymore, I believe. So it manifested itself in, it was either cardinal or bishop, I believe. And so it was this activism. We don't need prayer. We don't need God. All we have to do is do these external works. Yeah, we need picket signs. We need to organize. We need to do something. We need to stand outside. We need to we need to line up. We need to vote. Right. We need to we need to have political action committees. Mm-hmm. That's the Americanist heresy. We got to do something. Right. We got to do something about it. Right. Whereas what we've all of this what this led has led up to is real the realization that I am not the source of my interior life. That Christ is. He's not the source. That he has to be the one truly truly acting. It has to be this vital living reality where I let him act through me. Um, and so if we read what the, the very last truth is, I think this is, this is really the thesis of the entire book, The Soul of the Apostle, what it all culminates in. So we just kind of cover 10 and now in 11. 11 is, if God calls me to good works, I must establish this firm conviction in my mind. Jesus has got to be and wishes to be the life of these works. My efforts by themselves are nothing absolutely nothing but when united to jesus christ life-giving action these efforts will become all powerful this applies to all of us it doesn't just apply to those who have things right it doesn't just apply to those who are living in total sin this applies to everyone striving to live a holy life and the reason for that is because we can do good things on the on the outside, and we can think we're good people. But if it isn't actually Christ is working, if we don't have a certain hesitancy with maybe this is too much of myself, 
it's going to last in sterile fruits. It's not going to be, they're going to be dead fruits. Um, and this can apply for those who have families, for those who are running an apostolate, for those who are helping out in the church, for any, just even doing your work in good things. If it's, if you're, you can do good things on the outside and look like a good person and you can go to hell or you can suffer for men, for a lot of time in purgatory. And, and ultimately, if we're looking at what the trajectory of the church is, this has to be the center of it. It's the vital life of Christ, not just we're doing this, we're doing new program, new thing. Um, you know, it's, it's not like, well, let's just throw a bunch of pizza parties and we're going to get everyone together and have a really good time, bruh. You know? Yeah. If it's, Jesus is not the life of restoring the faith, then restoring the faith is nothing. This is nothing. These microphones, these soundboards, this beautiful studio that we've built, uh, these these thousands of dollars that we've spent trying to produce this thing, the YouTube channel with the f- how may- however many followers, the Facebook likes, it's nothing. It's nothing. And that is the antidote to the Americanist heresy. The... The encyclical which defines the American heresy and overcomes it, which was addressed to the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Baltimore, Cardinal Gibbons. It says that, like, your propensity in America to activism, to doing something, to, to being a, instead of a reservoir of grace to being a conduit of grace. I just want to be a pass through, you know, I want to let the Holy spirit work through me. Yeah. You know, I'm going to let the Holy spirit want, work through yeah. me. I don't want to, I don't want to be the target. <laughs> and I don't, yeah. that's it. Work through me. Use me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Use me. Use me as a con. Yeah. Okay. You know what? If you get, there's be nothing. the guy that says, how what? about me? <laughs> What do you what do you use like some kind of wired circuit board? There's nothing going on unless there are electrons passing through you. And if there are right. no electrons passing through you, there's nothing. Nothing. Right? Yep. Nothing. True. We yep. just talked we have talked about eleven things. We talked about eleven things. How many of them said pick it? How many of them said organize labor unions? How many of them said vote? How many of them said do Pet- anything? Petition. Yeah, how yep. many of them do anything? Yep. None of, almost none of them said do anything. This is about a unity with our Lord, and it's about overcoming yourself. It's not about That's trying... That's the only doing. It's yep. not about controlling people around you or trying to influence things or the outcome of an election. It's not about trying to change someone's opinion about something. It's about trying to overcome your own sad sick, beastly nature. It's about uniting your own efforts to our Lord. And it's about ensuring that your soul can not only accept grace and receive it, but can accrue it in such a way that you are overflowing with exactly. it. Overflowing. Overflowing with grace. That's the, the phrase of uh, St. Thomas, uh, contemplata et contemplata alis tradere, to contemplate and to hand on the things having been contemplated, the contemplated things, the overflowing of that. Um, I, I wanted to, I've got a, it's a little long quote, but it's really telling of what is the product of this principle of the soul of the apostle, that Jesus Christ has to be the life of these works. Um, this is Dom Chotard quoting a priest regarding the question about how do you run an, a, an authentically Catholic apostolate. Quote, take my advice. Do not be afraid to aim as high as you possibly can. Not just mediocrity. You aim for the heights. And you will be astonished at the results. Let me explain. Do not merely have as your ideal to give the youth a selection of clean amusements that will turn them aside from illicit pleasures and dangerous associations nor simply to give them a Christian varnish through routine attendance at Mass or the reception of the sacraments at long intervals and with questionable dispositions. Launch out into the deep. Let your ambition be, first of all, the noble one of making a certain number of them at any cost. Take the firm resolution of living as fervent Christians, that is, of making their mental prayer every morning, going to Mass every day if they can, and doing a little spiritual reading 
besides going frequently to communion and fervently too. Put all your efforts into giving this select group a great love for Jesus Christ, the spirit of self-denial, prayer, vigilance over themselves, and a word, solid virtues. And take no less trouble to develop in their souls a hunger for the Holy Eucharist, and then stir up these young men to act upon their companions. Train them as frank, devoted apostles, kind, ardent, manly, not narrow-minded in their piety, full of tact and of zeal. Before two years have gone by, come and tell me whether you still need a need a lot of brass or stage sets to catch your fish. And this man asks him, shall I open the doors to all comers right from the start? He says, numbers will be no use to you unless everyone is handpicked. Let the growth of your club depend most of all on the influence exercised by the nucleus of the apostles, the center of which must be Jesus and Mary with you as their instrument. If you know how to build your club on the foundation of an ardent, complete, and apostolic Christian life, the bare minimum in the way of premises will always be enough to accommodate all the accessories demanded by the normal functioning of the club. Don't worry, you will soon find out that the noise does not do much good, and that which is good doesn't make much noise. And you will see a good, clear understanding of the gospel will cut down your expenses and far from hurting your success, it will promote it. But above all, you will have to pay the price yourself, not so much by wearing yourself out rehearsing plays or settling up football games, as by storing up in yourself the life of prayer. For you can be certain that to the extent to which you yourself are able to live on the love of our Lord will be the exact measure of your ability to stir it up in other people. Mm. That's beautiful. How many of us have a Christian varnish over our lives? I'm going to go ahead and just throw it out there that probably that stands for most of us and I don't exclude myself from that. Sure. Sure. A Christian varnish. How many of us attend the sacraments but lukewarmly? Sobering. How many of us will be vomited from the mouth of our Lord in the end? You mean my bro? My homeboy? Jesus is my homeboy? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of surprise. I think for all of us. At a oh, very, yeah. It's not going to pan out for any of us the way that we thought it was going to. Let me put it that way. Let's just say nobody's going to be su- let, nobody's not going to be surprised. Yeah, right. Right? Everyone's going to be surprised in the end. It's going to be a surprise. Uh, and 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 in particular for the masses. Mm-hmm. For one or two standard deviations from the curve from the median. All those people, the people inside the bell curve who think, well, I've been polite. I've been nice. I attended the gay wedding, you know, because I didn't want to offend anybody. Yeah. I didn't want to ruffle feathers. Look, I'm just, I love people. Or let's go super hardcore. We're all trying to go the same yeah. place. Yeah. But we're, let's just say we went super hardcore. I was a, a you know, I, I, I was a good father. I made sure that all of my kids got a good Catholic education. We were never hungry. Yeah, we were never hungry. Right. Um, you know, you know, we, we, we made sure that they went to mass on Sunday and. And then they all lose the faith. Yeah. And then they yeah. lose the faith. I did my duty. Free will. Right? Free will. I can't and control I respect them. Back to that. Yep. I respect them as adults. They'll come around if they want to. It yep. is what it is. Yep. I did the best that I could. I took them to CCD, Catholic How Coffee and Donuts. Catholic yep. Coffee and Donuts. <laughs> and they, I mean, go ahead. No, I mean, how many of us are going to be, in the end, we're going to be standing, we're going to see, finally, we're going to see our lives objectively. We all wish that our Lord just kept a, two sets of books, one set of books strictly for everyone around us, mm. and one set of books very liberally in our favor for us. True. Right? And finally, we will see the set, we will see what our lives were from his point of view, not from ours, but from his. And we, will, we might actually be surprised. Might be surprised. We might be shocked. We might be disgusted. We might be repulsed. When we look at our lives and we say, wow. How many times did I spit you out of my mouth, Lord? And how just is it that you would then do the same, spit me out of yours. And say that you never knew me because the truth is I never knew you. 
True. Kids pick up on this. They need true leadership from the depths of our souls. Uh, this is the this is sort of the summary of this credo. The credo of the interior life, once it has become for my soul the whole foundation of its existence, guarantees to it, even here below, a participation in the joys of heaven. The interior life is the life of the elect. Dom Chotard. So we know that this is what it's going to take for us to make it happen. This there. is the essence of what our faith leads to. Our baptism gives us the participation of the divine life in our soul and orients us to the beatific vision. And we have a foreshadowing of that through contemplation, through union with Christ in our soul here below. All right, now let's have, let's have like a real conversation now, okay? You, you either, you did one of two things if you're listening to this right now. You either fast forwarded because we told you at the beginning that we're making a major announcement and now you're here and you want to just fast forward the major announcement. If you did that and you're listening to this part of the show and you didn't listen to the rest of it, go back and listen, okay? Because you're not going to understand these comments. Now, if you're in the second group of people and you have persevered through this show, we're looking right at the camera right now. We're looking at you, okay? We're looking at you and we're looking at ourselves. You fought your concupiscence. Good job. <laughs> you are thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I have a long way to go. I don't even know where to start. I don't implement any of these 11 things. A lot of them don't even make sense to me. You guys said words. You were talking in English, and I don't. It didn't translate into my English brain. Okay, if you're in that population, as many of us are, that's okay. It's okay. All right. It's okay because God has given you the gift of time. You don't know how much time God's going to give you, but He's giving you the time right now. And this is the time where we make the announcement that we are going to provide you a solution. If we just went through these 11 points in the soul of the apostolate and you didn't understand any of them and you've never heard the word concupiscence before, it's okay, all right? Everybody starts somewhere and this program is for you. Kevin is starting a program for you and he's releasing it through us. So we go back to the 11th point of this thing. If what we're doing is not united to Christ, it is dung. It is the dust of the earth. Okay. And so we want to do this for you, for you. So Kevin's going to explain what Soka is, soul of the apostolate. Okay. We've talked about this book but there's something major coming down the pike and Kevin's going to give you a quick preview of it. Just a teaser, just a teaser. So Soka or souls of the Christian apostles is based on this text that we just covered. The, we just covered like the first, like we, we covered 10 pages of this, whatever, hundred. We scratched pages. the car. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even get to the undercoat. No. <laughs> Didn't even open the hood. Didn't pop the hood. Yeah. Yeah, let's go with that that analogy. We scratched the car of the soul of the apostolate. What Soka is, is essentially a formation for you to become an interior apostle, as Dom Chotard is talking about, for you to live a deep intimacy with our Lord and therefore emanate grace through your life to help save souls, because that's what grace does. You cannot be saved without sanctifying grace, the life of Christ. That's it. You can't. But if you are living a, an authentic, vital life of that, then you can. So we have a program of formation. We're going to be setting up apostolates, and we're going to be have individualized stages of growth for those who desire to live a daily intimacy with our Lord. So the base of that is going to be a rule of life that has what's called mental prayer or daily meditation, mm. at least five decades of the rosary, and spiritual reading. This all nourishes the soul. That's just on a daily basis. On a monthly basis, there's much more confession, fasting, that sort of stuff. But it's all about helping you to live a truly vital life of Christ in your soul. And this is so necessary to have in our modern context. Now, you might ask, 
well, how do we, how do we, yeah, I can just say I'm going to do these things. But there's so many times when I've said, I want to do, I want to pray and I don't do it. I hear that so often. Yeah. Or I hear parents say, well, I, I want to help my kids. What do I do? Well, you need to be praying. If you're not praying, then, or mm-hmm. a priest tell me, people mm-hmm. come to me, they want spiritual direction. And then they talk and talk and talk. And then, then I ask them, did they pray? And they're like, no, I haven't been praying. And we don't want to hear that as Americans. We just don't. Hey, I want to do, I want to achieve this goal. What should I be doing? And then the saints tell us, well, you should pray. You should pray. It, 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 it's, a, it's a beautiful analogy to talk about it from a growing, right? So you're planting a seed in, 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 a, in this context, right, of receiving the information of what it takes to actually grow into a great big tree to grow in the garden of the uh, of the garden that we were thrown out of that we that that Adam chose for us to be thrown out of right and so we're planting a seed trying to grow that into the new garden that the, the heaven that 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 God has prepared for us and we don't you, it takes time to grow a big old tree right we anybody who's listening to this right now is already at a disadvantage because you've already have an intellect that is operating right a 3 year old is not going to understand any of these words that we're having this you you have an opportunity for the 3 year old to plant a seed in the ground right now as a leader of a family if you happen to be a leader of a family if you are understanding the words that are coming out of my mouth you are already now like okay, and I just put the seed in the ground, and now we have to wait for the the sprout to come out of the ground, and now we're only going to be this big of a tree, given the time that we've been given. We don't know how much time that is. I could be a bean sprout. I could be, you know, uh, 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 a sapling, or, or I'm going to be a ten year old tree, right? I'm not. I, I'm not going to be this glorious oak, right? And, and, and I'm speaking in very broad terms here, right? And whatnot. People have, you say, people like St. Augustine, as an example, figured out a way to accelerate growth over a period of time, I know, right? But man, they're, they're still trying to crack that nut, man. He yeah. did a good job. He, he did, did a great job. He fast in a forwarded a very short fer- period of time. <laughs> yeah, but that's grace. Yeah, exactly. That is grace. That's grace. That is grace. But for for most of us, right? We're we're talking about we, we only have this much time to actually grow. Yeah, that. we we yeah. have saints that give us extreme examples, but we only have this much time to try to grow as quickly as we can to be the biggest, baddest tree that we can possibly be by the time we're chopped down and actually brought to heaven. So many of you have heard of this sort of fad that's going around and a lot of people are participating in it. And it's a very attractive thing. It's called Exodus 90. And I'm not here to condemn it. Many of our listeners, viewers, watchers, fans, likes, people are out there and they're doing it. And that's fine. That's fine that you're doing it. But at the end of the day, I think that you're going to come up short. You're going to come up short on E90 because E90 not only does not correspond to the liturgical year, but most importantly, it doesn't nourish the soul in the way that this program does. So we are so pleased to announce here at Restoring the Faith that Soka will be released with us. We are going to bring it to you. We're going to help bring it to you. Kevin's engineered it. He's here. He's releasing it to you. This is coming soon to a theater near you, right? Like this is like the trailer. This is where you get people excited and stuff <laughs> about what Soka is. But Soka is it's it's for men and for women. You know, it's for everybody. Single, married. Yep. And yep. if you're wondering, well, well, why do I need this? You know, I'll just do it on my own. How many times have you said that you're going to pray and you didn't? Think about that. Are you living a daily life of intimate mental prayer where you're conversing with our Lord in your soul? But not even that, you have contemplation? Let's just be honest, you're not. Yeah. You Let, said you were, but you won't. Put it in the comments if you've already read The Soul of the Apostolate. Put it in the comments a week from now. The Soul of the Apostolate is a, is not a thick book. It's not thick. Look at it. That, that in a week from now, put How many it out of you there are read it? That, that you've actually read it. Say, I've read it. I've read it. It will give you seven days. See if you've read it. And so 
And so furthermore, when you make a resolution, this you believe this is the one thing necessary. I'm going to do something for this. You don't just make it in some, you know, in the clouds. You know, if you're making, you made a resolution yeah. to your spouse, you, it's usually about something concrete, right? My and resolution so, is that I'm going to love you better. Oh, okay. Well, uh, day three. <laughs> day three. I, am I going to love you better? What, what does that mean? What right. does that mean? Every goal needs to be specific, measurable, timely, uh, you know, all these things. Yeah. And so if you have specificity with your goals for habits and accountability with that, you are 95% more likely to establish that habit. How many people use that practical reality and understanding for worldly ends? It's like having a workout buddy. Exactly. It's like having a workout buddy. Or a vegan <sighs> buddy. Or, or a, a vegan buddy. A vegan Within 60 buddy. seconds of meeting you, a vegan will tell you that they're vegan. It's, like, it's, it's, it's probably faster than when you meet a Texan. If when you is. meet a Texan, they will let you know within uh, 65 yeah. seconds so or so. by about 30 seconds. That yeah, they're yeah. from Texas. <laughs> I'm from Texas. I'm from America's favorite southern neighbor, okay? All right. I get it. All right? I'm, I get it. It's finger licking good. <laughs> the vegans love to tell you that they're vegan, but they have, like, their little support groups. They're like, oh, I'm a vegan because I don't want to oppress animals and you don't want to oppress animals. And like, let's talk about let's be that. vegans together. How many of us are, instead of being vegans together, let's be, can we be Catholics together? Can we do that? Can we, we be Catholics to together? together? Can we meet up in heaven? Let's have a meetup. Let's yeah. have a meetup upstairs in heaven, in the heavenly court. After we've had to accuse ourselves in the presence of our lady, John the Baptist, St. Michael the Archangel, and all the angels and saints. So let's work on that. So Soka is coming to a theater near you. Kevin is now officially, he's got the pen. I'm not even wearing a pen. I couldn't, I couldn't find my pen for the show. <laughs> I'm not wearing a pen. Kevin is wearing an RTF yeah, pen. Too. Restoring the Faith is going to help distribute Soka. And Soka is finally... Finally, the alternative that we have needed, that we've been waiting for, those of us that tried Exodus 90, we started Exodus 90, we failed at Exodus 90, this is the, this is the program that we've been waiting for. And it works for people like Pope St. Pius X. Ever heard of him? That worked. Not a bad one. <laughs> Not a bad one. Excluding the Vatican II popes, he's the only pope in 500 years to be canonized. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm honored by the words, Mike. I mean, I, I think um, the, the big thing that we have to offer is there's also the, practic or the, there's the practicality. There's the interior life. There's the notion that it's not just for you, but your goal is it's, it's an overflowing, as we said. You're a reservoir that's going to emanate grace and help save souls, and the, especially those closest to you. Um, and, and, and it's something that's long term. You know, I think there are people who do Exodus and, and they find it fruitful for their spiritual life and, um, you know, they become detached. We need something long term as well, you know, um, and, and so this is a rule of life that is something constant. Or it, you, speaking in vegan terms, it's sustainable. Well, there you go. There it is. Are it's you a hidden? It's, are it's you sustainable. sustainable. Vegan, Listen, yeah. I, I speak Denver. He's totally closet. <laughs> I speak Denver, okay? All right, I speak Colorado. Mank. Uh, <laughs> bro, bro, bro. Uh, okay, so very quickly, Kevin, before he hits the button. You've got an app coming out. We're going to be releasing videos. This is a personal journey for every man, woman, and child. Right? Yes. So let's get on this thing together. Married or unmarried? Single or not single? Always with the life of grace. This program is sort of like how Restoring the Faith is. Boldly, authentically, and unapologetically Catholic. So let's get on board with it. Soka coming soon. Kevin on board with RTF. Subscribe to the channel. We got more for you. Here it comes. Thanks, bros. Living the Faith Podcast. Brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. Restoringthefaith.com.